Hello, and welcome to another episode of Inventor's Quick Tips. You may have seen commercials on TV for free inventor's kits that you can send away for. Well, in this video, I'm sharing my free inventor's kit. And the good news is, not only is it free, but you don't even have to send away for it. Just stick around and the kit will be yours. Many people have an idea. Sometimes they kick it around in their head for a long time before they finally decide to take action. But when it comes to finally taking action, what action should we take and when? For inventors in this situation, I've tried to break it down into four basic steps. Now each situation is unique and there is no one-size-fits-all approach, but many inventors I've worked with have gotten started with the techniques I will be explaining in this video. Step 1. Is it a good idea? If we are going to spend time, money, and effort, we'd like to be working with a good idea. How do we get a sense of how good our idea is? Stick around, we'll touch on that in a few. Determining if the idea is new is particularly important if you want to pursue patent protection. It costs money to apply for a patent, and if the idea is not new, it's likely that money spent will not result in a patent grant, so we want to check on that. More on how to make such assessments uh, later on in this video. There are multiple ways that can be used to protect an idea. In this video, we are focusing on patents, but there are other ways as well. One important thing to know is that there are advantages to filing a patent application before any public use or disclosure of your invention. So if possible, that is considered a best practice to do that. Finally, we want to promote the idea to customers, to investors, and other potential stakeholders. We are not going in depth about how to promote an invention, but more on when to promote. We normally don't want to wait until a patent issues because that can take years. Typically, once patents are applied for, development and promotion activities may take place. It is often useful to see a common development sequence. This is one sequence I often see. Someone has an idea and they write it up. Once the idea is articulated enough to be down on paper, the research begins. What else is out there? What alternatives are there to my invention? How good are they? This is all to help us decide if it's worth going forward with the invention. Because it's a lot of work, so a little research before embarking on an expensive, time-consuming endeavor can be worth it. Then, assuming we didn't find anything similar in our searching, a provisional patent application is filed. The provisional patent application serves as a one-year placeholder. Within one year, a utility, sometimes called a regular, patent application needs to be filed in order to take advantage of that provisional patent application. The provisional patent application is easier and cheaper to file than a regular patent application, so it is a popular option when still in the early stages of an invention. During that year, the inventor will work on building prototypes. This is a very good thing to do because you will undoubtedly learn what really works and what doesn't. And also, a prototype can be an excellent promotional tool for your invention. Finally, before that one year period expires, a regular utility patent application is filed. Things that were developed during the prototyping can be included in this patent application, even though they may not have been known or included when the provisional patent application was filed back in step three. So this is one common sequence I see inventors do. Now I'd like to show you another one. Some people get the idea and start building the prototype right away even before they've written anything down. And only after the prototype is working do they think about going forward with the idea. So let's look at that scenario. So in this case, the inventor built a prototype. Now we have to have a write-up because we need the idea down on paper. Again, we can do searching and analyzing of what we find similar to the first sequence to see if it's worth proceeding. Then, assuming it is worth proceeding, in step four, we go straight to the regular utility patent application. Note that we don't need to file a provisional patent application if we already have sufficient information to know fully how the invention works and what its features are. So again, these are not one-size-fits-all solutions and other orders of the steps are possible. 
but these two sequences are some of the more common ones that I see inventors doing. I'm going to stop right here just to dispel two common misconceptions that I often hear. One I've heard is that you can mail a copy of your invention description to yourself as proof of the date of conception. That is not helpful and does nothing to protect your idea. The second one is that you need to have a patent actually issue or grant before you can try to commercialize your invention. That usually is not true. The time between when you file an application and when a patent may issue is typically two to three years. So you usually don't want to wait all that time to start developing your invention and promoting it. Once your patent applications are on file, it's usually a good time to start developing your invention. How do we assess commercial potential? It is critical to know your industry. If you have an invention in a field that you already know well, you're on your way. So for example, if you're in the plumbing supply business and you invent a plumbing tool, you probably already know that field pretty well. But if you have an invention outside your primary field, it's essential to know that business and a little extra research and homework is in order. Here are two techniques for evaluating an idea. Let's go through them. The first one is called the problem solution statement. Basically, we write down the problem of blank is solved by blank. Here's an example. Pretend we invented this, the iron with the auto shutoff. And here is a sample problem solution statement. The problem of leaving an iron on inadvertently is solved by implementing a timer to shut off the iron. Now, sometimes I've seen inventors get tripped up on this, especially the second blank. Let's look again. Here's the blank form. And now, here's another invention that somebody once came to me with, a bad fruit detector. An inventor had an idea for a product that you could wave over a piece of fruit such as cantaloupe and determine if it is ripe or not. Because who wants to buy a bad piece of fruit? So it turns green if the fruit is good, or it shines a red light if the fruit is not good and you shouldn't buy it. So let's go to our problem solution statement. The inventor came up with the problem of detecting a bad fruit is solved by, hmm, they couldn't really figure out how it worked. In other words, they had a concept, but they didn't really know how they were going to do it. So this is an indication that the invention is not developed enough to start the patent application process. Factors of comparison. How do we compare products? We can look at cost, performance, convenience, reliability, safety. There's a lot of others that we could use. It depends on the product. Noise, a horn, you want more noise. Muffler, you want less noise. Um, are other companies out there making something similar? How hard is it to make? Who buys it? When do they buy it? Is it something seasonal like snow removal? These are all things to consider. Now, here is a technique called value factors analysis, or VFA. It's basically a bang for the buck analysis. The value factors analysis is an attempt to quantify by providing a score about how good an idea is. Of course, there is still some subjectivity involved, but let's take a look with two simplified examples. Okay, so how do we do it? First, we're going to list factors, how important each factor is, create a table, and come up with a score using really simple math. So we need products to do that. So we're going to have two products and we'll compare. So the first one is a 1996 Dodge Caravan. So the idea here is, let's say we were thinking about developing this van ourselves. Prior to this van, all the vans had one sliding door on the passenger side. And now here in 1996, we're going to have thinking about going forward with a second sliding door on the driver's side. So let's list an aspect. Convenience, okay? And how important is convenience on a scale of 1 to 5? We'll say for minivan owners, it's pretty important because you're carrying bags, you have passengers, perhaps young children, so the more convenience you have, the better. So we'll rank the one-door model of one sliding door as a 3 and the two sliding doors a 5. So there's an increase in benefit. Y you can see the one-door column has a benefit score of 15, and the two-door has a benefit score of 25. And then there's a cost factor, right? <coughs> we know that the cost of the two-door 
two sliding door minivan will be a little more expensive because you have more parts, a larger bill of materials, but the cost will go up maybe slightly compared to the price of the one door van. So when we divide the benefit by the cost, we see that even though the cost increases, the benefit increases even more. And if we compare at the bottom row there, the one door minivan to the two door minivan, the score on the two door minivan comes out higher. So let's take a look at one more example. Here we have a Honda Prelude. This was a car from the late 80s and early 90s that had as an option four wheel steering. So let's take a look at this. So here we have three factors, reliability, handling, and economy, and their importance. Well, it was a sports car, so reliability, we'll figure that is important no matter what kind of car you have, because who wants to get stranded? Handling, it's a sports car, so um, that's pretty important, right? So we'll give that a five. Economy, we'll give that a three, because um, you know most people don't buy a sports car strictly concerned about economy. So we have two models, the two-wheel steering, which is the middle column, and then on the right is the four-wheel steering vehicle scores. So for reliability, we'll give each of them a four. For handling, we'll give the four-wheel steering a five because it handles a little better. That's the whole point of having the four-wheel steering. The economy goes down a little bit because it's heavier, it has more parts, and it weighs more. And so when we look at the benefits, the benefits go up, but not by that much. However, when we look at the cost, the complexity and cost of adding four-wheel steering is quite a lot. And so when we compare the score, we see that the four-wheel steering has the lower score. So the problem with this particular product was that the two-wheel steering version already handled pretty good. So yes, the four-wheel steering version handled better, but it was already good to begin with. So even though it improved in its capabilities, the extra cost made it really not worth it. And to a certain extent, history has proved that this is true because um, four-wheel steering, while it does exist in some vehicles, never really caught on. Whereas two, door, two sliding door vans, uh, that's pretty much the only way they make them now. So we know that that was correct. So history has shown that these results are accurate um, in this particular instance. So you could do this with your invention. You list the aspects, the importance, and you crunch it out and see, see what you get. So now let's talk about getting started with a write-up. If you haven't written up something about your invention, it's important to think about doing that. Because unless you can put it down on paper and put it into words and describe it, nobody's going to be able to file a patent application for it. So how do you get started? I usually like to start with rough sketches or photos, uh, name all the parts, give numbers to all the parts, and then explain what you see. Pretend you're talking to a friend explaining how it works and just write it all down. Uh, if you need more details, I have a video that's pretty much dedicated to helping you get started with writing up your idea. So I'll put a link to that in the description. Again, let's come back to prototyping. Remember, I said prototyping is worthwhile and important. Two main reasons. One is learning. When you actually build it and put it together, you'll learn what works, what doesn't, what could be improved. It may generate yet other ideas and features as you're actually using it. And another important reason, it's an effective promotional tool. If somebody sees a video of your product actually doing something, or they get to, better yet, even try it themselves, that can really be convincing for customers, for investors. So having a working prototype when possible is a useful thing. I have a video about uh, prototyping in general, and I will put a link to that in the description below. Finally, protection. There's two main forms of protection that we typically talk about on this channel. Those are provisional patent applications and regular patent applications. Uh, there's also trade secrets 
which doesn't come into play as often, at least in the types of inventions that I work with. But I have videos on provisional patent application writing, as well as one about the difference between patents versus trade secrets. And I will put a link to those in the description as well. Finally, we talked about uh, searching and analysis, right? We want to know what's out there. That helps us make a good decision. Why do we want to search? Again, learning. You could tell I like learning because we're always talking about learning. So learning is something when we search and we see how other people have approached a problem, we're going to learn things and that's always good. It helps us become better inventors. And importantly is the go no go decision. In other words, filing patent applications and pursuing an invention costs a lot of money. So there's really no point in doing it if we search and we find, you know, many other very similar things out there then we may say, you know what, we're going to table this idea and go on to something else. I have a video that can help you get started with searching. We're lucky in the internet age that there's a lot of searching resources that you can do over the internet for free. And this video talks about many of those. So just to recap, okay, we talked about four basic steps. Okay, assess if the idea is good, assess if it's new, protect it, and promote it. We didn't really get into the promotion too much, I know, as that's really product dependent, but the key is the order. Notice that the protection, filing patent applications, comes before the promoting, and that's the preferred way to do it. So here you have, between this video you just saw, as well as the videos in the description below, a good inventor's kit to help you get started with your invention process. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If so, please like, share, and subscribe, and thanks again for watching. Bye. <laughs>